Hello, this is Dr. Mark Rosen, and today we're going to be looking at critical care ultrasound vignettes number two. And once again, these vignettes are real life cases, and the purpose of looking at these vignettes is to see how ultrasonography can affect medical care in the intensive care unit or the emergency department. So let's look at case number two. In this case, you're rounding in the intensive care unit when one of the nurses calls you to see one of the other patients on a stat basis. Mr. S is a 62-year-old male with pneumonia who was in the ICU for his pneumonia for about three days. He was doing very well with no shortness of breath, and today he was going to be transferred out to the wards. Suddenly, he dropped his O2 sats and became diaphoretic and short of breath. His blood pressure is unchanged at 130 over 86. His past history includes diabetes, gastritis, mild renal insufficiency, presumably from the diabetes, and COPD. His vital signs are as follows. Blood pressure is 130 over 86, a pulse of 108, respiration is 22. He's afebrile with a pulse ox of 86% on 2 liters per minute nasal cannula. His general appearance of that of a patient with mild shortness of breath which is different than how he was just a few hours ago. He's able to speak in full sentences without difficulty, but clearly has some shortness of breath that was not there previously. His heart exam is normal. His lung exam is unchanged from yesterday, with mild crackles in the right upper lobe, where his pneumonia was seen on the radiograph. There's no JVD. His abdomen is benign, and his extremities reveals no edema. So then we come back to the same question, what would you do now? Mr. S did not appear to require intubation. He was short of breath, but certainly nowhere nearing uh, re requiring intubation. He was changed from his oxygen at 2 liters a minute nasal cannula to 40% by mask. His O2 sats increased, and he was carefully monitored to be sure his mental status did not change from CO2 narcosis. He did not appear to be a CO2 retainer, and his mental status stayed at its baseline normal state. The following tests were ordered. STAT chest x-ray, EKG, ABG, CBC, basic chem panel, and in case he needed anticoagulation, a baseline INR and PTT. The plan was that if his chest x-ray was unchanged, there would be a strong suspicion for a possible pulmonary embolism or acute coronary syndrome, and that he would then require anticoagulation. If the chest x-ray was severely different, then a CT angio might not be required. But if his chest x-ray was unchanged and there was no other explanation radiographically, a CT angio was to be ordered, and the presumptive diagnosis of pulmonary embolism would be entertained. A focus bedside ultrasound exam was performed while awaiting the tests, and it included the following. A cardiac ultrasound to assess whether or not he had dysfunctional segments, as you would see with an acute coronary syndrome. A fast skin of the abdomen, which actually is done very rapidly, and would look for intra-abdominal bleeding. And a scan of both of his legs to see if he had a deep vein thrombosis, which can be seen in 50% of people with pulmonary emboli. Now, it's important to realize how rapidly all of these tests could be done. This chest x-ray was ordered on a stat basis and took slightly less than 10 minutes to be performed. But all these scans were completed by the time the chest x-ray was actually done. Now, here's a, a typical four-chamber apical view of the heart. And this serves as a good indication of what you can see in a typical four-chamber apical view. Right atrium, I'm sorry, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle here. But the probe has been turned slightly to make this into more of a two-chamber view, where we can see left ventricle here and left atrium here. Blood flowing from the left atrium through the mitral valve opening here and closing here into the left ventricle. 
And the purpose of this particular angle is to illustrate the apex of the heart. So the apex of the heart resides here. And it's important to note that in this patient, where we can see the left ventricle very clearly due to his LVH, the apex of the heart is made up almost exclusively of the left ventricle. The right ventricle, which is somewhat cut off in this view, on this particular patient, the right ventricle is seen as a small sliver coming up to the apex. Now, if we would have turned the probe to see a, a clear four-chamber apical view, rather than concentrating on these two chambers, you would see that the right ventricle occupies approximately two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. Now let's look at another image. This is the actual four-chamber apical view of Mr. S. And this is what you would typically see for a very clear four-chamber apical view. Left atrium going to the left ventricle. The mitral valve can be seen opening with the valve tethered at both valves here to the chordae tendinae going to the papillary muscle. Septum is over here. And this is the right side of the heart. Right atrium, tricuspid valves, opening and closing, right ventricle. The arrow is placed here, pointing to the apex of the heart. So the apex of the heart really is about here. Now, as we saw on the prior image, the apex of the heart should be made up primarily of the left ventricular apex. And the right ventric ventricle should be a small sliver, but that's not the case here. Over here, it's split approximately 50% right side, 50% left side. Another finding is that if you look at the size of the right ventricle, it is not two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. They're approximately of equal size. In fact, it's difficult to measure in this particular view without calipers, but if we froze the image, you would find that the right ventricle actually is slightly bigger than the left ventricle which is not normal. The other thing is to look at the contractility of the ventricle. The base of the left ventricle, if I put my indicator here, is contracting around it, almost as if it's trying to bite that small arrow. If I move up here, this part here at the apex is not contracting as well. So there is a little bit of dyskinesis. So note the apical hypokinesis at the arrow, as well as the size of the right ventricle, which is enlarged. The EKG shows a sinus rhythm with a conduction defect and nonspecific STT wave changes. The FAST scan was done, and it was normal, which was not much of a surprise. But it was very rapid and easy to do, especially since we already had part of the fast scan done, since we already were looking at we already were looking at the heart. Then we move to the left leg. Now, over here on the left leg is the femoral artery. And it says over here this is overcompression. And indeed, the resident who's performing this test is overcompressing the femoral artery. It takes a while to note exactly how much one should compress the artery and vein to look for a DVT. But as a general rule, use enough force that you shouldn't really compress the artery very much, maybe ever so slightly. But here you can see the artery is being very distorted and becomes highly contractile over here. Now bear in mind that the resident here is putting on too much pressure, so actually over compressing the structures. Over here, this vein should definitely collapse if, it, if the structures are being overly compressed. But yet at the tip of the arrow, once it's compressed, you can see over here, quite visibly, uh, the clot. So this patient has a, a left femoral vein clot. So what's the bottom line of this case? There's apical hypokinesis no increase in troponin, 
but the troponin was drawn immediately. I suspect that the troponin would be increased in a short time. And the apical hypokinesis is probably from ischemia. It may be old, as in an old uh, infarction, or it may be new, as with ischemia. But more important, actually, is that there's an enlarged right ventricle. And this is commonly seen with pulmonary embolism. So it's hard to tell from this whether the changes for uh, the apex are old or new. It could be new onset of ischemia. It could be an old uh, infarcted area. But definitely there's an enlarged right ventricle. Again, one could not tell if that's old or new unless there was an echo or another bedside ultrasound for comparison. But in this clinical situation where we're worried about pulmonary embolism, that's rather large, a large finding for pulmonary emboli, especially in view of positive scan for deep vein thrombosis. So this presumptive diagnosis of pulmonary embolism from a DVT as the etiology for the shortness of breath, and possibly secondary myocardial ischemia if that apical hypokinesis is new. Now the CTA was avoided, which is actually quite good since this patient did have renal insufficiency from his diabetes. Pulmonary embolism and acute coronary syndromes are both treated early with heparin. This patient's primary problem ended up being the pulmonary embolism. The patient had no further EKG changes and the nonspecific changes went away. The apical hypokinesis actually did go away later on also. So there was some ischemia, and the enlarged right ventricle went away as well. So in this case, early bedside ultrasound picked up two diagnoses and allowed for early intervention for not only the myocardial ischemia, which was presumably secondary to the primary diagnosis, but the primary diagnosis, which was pulmonary embolism, secondary to a deep vein thrombosis. Important to note is that all of this was picked up at the bedside without radiation, without contrast, and before the chest x-ray was even performed. So thank you, and we'll see you at the next vignette for some additional learning about critical care ultrasonography.